have just been informed by I'm Michael Fairhurst, and I'm going to be talking about why making a programming language is awesome. Um, before I do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of an about me to put it in perspective. So I don't have a computer science degree, and I know PhDs are anything crazy that help me, you know, try this crazy project. Um, and I work at a company called Postano, which is a cool place to work, but it works with social media, so like Twitter APIs, uh, Instagram APIs. Not the place you generally expect to find a programming language designer. Um, and in my day-to-day -day programming, I usually try to place an emphasis on unit testing. And you're unit testing, unit testing, trying to understand what the ups and downs of each are, and um, trying to write uh, testable code. Uh, so that both testable now and in the future is always a really fun challenge to me, something I really like thinking about. And then uh, after sort of all of this sort of you know, random collection of facts about this particular developer, uh, I decided to make the programming language Wake. Uh, I'm rocking one of the six shirts I had printed for it. Um, and uh, I've been uh, creating Wake for about two years now. And I have this sort of lonely feeling because creating Wake has been this amazing process for me. It's been a super cool project. I've learned a lot, it's kind of fun. And I don't know too many people who have had projects of their own that are similar. Um, not too many people I've talked to uh, have really done much you know, beginning to end language tooling. So I know there's no such thing as a typical programmer, uh, but I think most of us in this room can agree with some of these bullet points. Um, so in the modern world, we hear about new programming languages that pop up all the time. It's kind of a revolution right now. Lots of new ones are coming up. Um, we hear about it on Hacker News or on Reddit or just via email. And some of us like this. Some of us are, you know, some of us are really interested by all the cool languages that are coming out. Uh, way too many are coming out. And others of us are more pessimistic. They're like, I'm not going to really use this at work. You know, uh, it's not going to replace Java. You know, what are you trying to do? Um, but I think. All of us uh, do have an appreciation for the accomplishments that these languages might be pulling off, even if we don't get to use them. Um, so particularly, I know I'm really interested in, in Rust. The claim to have the same performance, or nearly, nearly the same performance as C++ without using garbage collection is amazing. You know, you can yeah, you skip the garbage collection. You don't have to uh, worry about memory leaks or you know, use after freeze, double freeze, all these things. Uh, that makes C++ so unsafe. And you know, how will they do that is still an evolving, evolving thing, but any accomplishments they can make to figure out how we can do that, even if it doesn't succeed in Rust, are all very cool. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, another shout out would be Avail. Uh, Avail is kind of a small team that kind of just popped up, but uh, they have made the most literate programming language I've ever seen. You can structure sort of, sort of words and and sentences and, and grammar structures, and it turns it into these running programs that, that read like a book. And uh, yeah, I, I certainly haven't used it, but I think the fact that they've developed something which can do that is very incredible. And sometimes, like maybe in the case of Avail, we'll see. Sometimes it's when a language doesn't take off that it teaches us even more about maybe this, maybe the most literate program you could ever write isn't the ultimate ideal in creating readable code. Maybe it's something else. So. In addition to this, you know, sort of appreciation, like I hope we all have, uh, we, of course, use language tools every day, right? And there's the obvious ones. We obviously use compilers, and we obviously use interpreters, you know, depending on which of the two you're most wrapped up in. Um, but we also use it for linters, you know, JSLint, and, and minifiers, and debuggers, and IDEs, and even you know, static, static analysis tools and syntax highlighters. And we're all around it. And I think sometimes we forget that these are programs that people wrote and sort of open source their own free time sort of projects. And sometimes we think it's, it's too hard to take on or I don't know. And so that's part of what I'm curious about. So if you have anything that makes you not want to do it, I'll just say here, programming language infrastructure is so much fun to create. There's something about accepting any huge variety of input that you can't possibly account for. Your job is to make people able to write anything easily. Um, and being able to account for all that, all that input and actually write running programs and have people write programs and it just works, it's just a phenomenal experience. It's, it's a really, really unbounded, unbounded space to program in. 
And it obviously is going to depend on what particular tool you try to write, for what language. But I think, I think all of us will find that as we write tools for a particular language, we learn about it. We learn a ton about how that language behaves in the corner cases and how you know, it restructures our brains to sort of know what's going on. And when we can code, we can spend that much more brain power on what we're coding and that much less brain power on how the, the compiler might interpret it. Because we, we know how the compiler interprets it. We've, we've written a language tool for it. So what about Wake? You know, what, what's the project that has given me any authority to talk about this? Uh, Wake is a programming language in version 0.2.0 right now, so it's still in alpha. Um, maybe a bit early to print shirts, but. <laughs> um, and it is made to be expressive. Uh, starting as a developer, I really liked PHP, Python, and JavaScript. And uh, I you know, really liked the expressiveness of that, and I was afraid to move away from them to lose that expressiveness. Uh, it's also made me type safe. I did eventually, and one of those developers, I'm just not good enough to program in a dynamic language. Like, I need types. I, you know, I'll have bugs otherwise. And uh, Wake is made to be type safe. So it's, it tries to merge those two. Of course, it's, it's not the first programming language to try and accomplish both things. Uh, it's a very common goal. And since I love unit tests, uh, another big core aspect of waste design is testability first. I, I could have done a talk on you know, what I think makes testable code and the implications of things, but that can get pretty deep. Um, so I, I haven't covered it too much. But I will say that even the expression new person, new printer, new my class has testability implications either now or in the future that we often don't even think about. So to really solve this, it really had to be done at a language level. And not much else has changed, but that, that has changed. And a lot of it is very familiar to what we'll talk about. And it just had to be done at the very core. Um, at the moment, it compiles to JavaScript. As I mentioned, I, I'm not a huge fan of JavaScript, but of course, it's everywhere. We have to deal with it. So it's yet another AllJS language. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't aim to be just an AllJS language. Uh, I, have, I have a goal, which I haven't realized yet, to, um, to have it compile to other languages as well. Maybe make it something like, there's a language called Hex, which does that well, something like that. So yes, I needed to be a little bit crazy to decide to embark on a project like this. Um, I thought the testability goal was something that would give me a reason to put all the effort in. And there was another language that had tried to do it called Noah, started by some Googlers, uh, which was abandoned. So I, I thought I'd try my hand at it. So I, I got a, just a little text file. And I just started making little syntaxes that I thought might you know, look pleasing and do interesting things. I just just made these little things. It comes in like a madman of like, this can't be allowed. Like, this would be cool. You know, I don't think we can even do this. Should this be possible? And um, the first thing I actually wrote for Wake was a syntax highlighter so I could really feel what it would be like to really program in Wake before there was, you know, you know even more than a few guidelines and some random ideas. Um, so once I decided to, I had enough to go on, I uh, took a Coursera course. I don't know if everyone knows what Coursera is. It's Stanford courses online. They're free. There's a really good one on compilers. I recommend it to anyone who's interested. And um, so I find myself in this place of uh, you know, learning the four stages of how to create a compiler. But there's a lexer, a parser, a semantic analyzer, and a code generator. And because I decided to make Wake testable, you can't make anything. That you only get things with dependency injection. So before I could make an object to so much as print hello world, I wasn't. I had created these four things. I wasn't even done yet. I had created a dependency injection engine first. But after all that effort and all that craziness, fast forward through many many hours of work, and I was able to write, compile, and run this language or run this program. And just seeing the two most overused words of computer science, so where foo and bar are not words. Um, just seeing those two words printed out in my terminal was, was a really, really cool experience. It was really phenomenal. Um, it's, it was literally like, I felt this moment where it felt like Wake itself was announcing itself. It was, it was Wake that was saying, hello world, and I'm here. So um, hello world is cool, but I had a lot more things I wanted to you know, knock out next. Uh, so one of the ideas that I had uh, really liked in Wake was an idea based around how to merge type safety and expressiveness. Specifically, the usual tool of choice for that is type inference. 
But type inference, type inference has a lot of problems. It doesn't work very well in object-oriented languages, and for some fundamental reasons. It's also, um, it, it can go wrong, it can go wrong. And uh, the error messages can be awful to understand, absolutely awful to understand. Uh, and I just didn't really know much about type inference. I knew it wasn't a good fit, and that was about it. So I, I thought of an easier solution, maybe get some of the same goals. Instead of saying we should have variable names and no type so that we can infer the type, what if we said we can have a type and no variable name? We just use that type as the variable name. It's a pretty simple idea. In JavaScript, in, in Java, sorry, in Java we often say person, person, printer, per, you know, printer, printer, and it seemed like we could just roll with that. So it was kind of coming to life, and uh, I was getting further into the project, and eventually I found myself writing unit tests in Wake that tested the Wake compiler. And this is an excerpt from that test suite. So this is all Wake. You can see by now Wake has imports, it has annotations. Um, the, the line every assignments test begins a class. You can have multiple classes if you just begin a new one afterwards. And you can see there's this variable asserts and there's this variable num, and neither of them have names. They're both just types. <coughs> you can always have types, but surprisingly, they're just often not that useful. I'm sorry, you can always have variable names, but they're often not useful. Um, and this code runs on every build, and it passes. And sometimes when I'm writing this code, I just have to stop and like, it blows my mind, right? It's, it could only be weak. And it's really, really cool to find yourself writing something that could only be something that's, that you put so much time into. And this also led, this, this idea of making variable names optional um, also led to the single biggest happy accident in Wake's design. I realized that since types and variables were so interrelated, I could make a whole new type of iteration. I could make a new type before each loop. So this takes the expression watch argument array, which is a variable, and it automatically knows to remove the brackets and create a new variable name for you, simply watch argument. And we go on to do it here. We say, if not text array contains watch argument get watch type. Text array push watch argument get watch type. And the compiler is able to automatically figure this out pretty easily because we exchange types and variables like this. And this idea was like sitting on my lap for a year, and I didn't even realize it. Like I I can't even like someone else made it. I, it's it's and, but it's so cool to be able to read this, and, and the way that this code reads somewhat like a book, and it, once again, could, could only be weight. It's just a really cool experience. Oh boy, so now we have, we have arrays, and we have loops, and we have, you know, uh, variables, hello world, but Wake is a statically typed programming language. And since it's a statically typed programming language, it essentially needs generics. Um, Java, for instance, didn't have generics when it first comes out. And anyone who programs in Java will tell you that has lasting impacts, lasting consequences to this day. Uh, also, it's one of the things people love to make fun about. Go. Go is statically typed and doesn't have generics for some reason. I'm on board there, not understanding. And it's a common complaint. But generics were so far beyond what I ever, what I ever thought Wake would start doing. I never really thought about how they would work. I hadn't even really written much generic code. Um, I was still very much from a PHP background, PHP, Python, JavaScript background. But I, I, did, I did do the research, and I knew a little bit about it, and I, I'd used a little bit with C++. Um, and in terms of actually parsing the way someone declares, this is generic, that's now easy for me. I have a lot of practice with parsing all the things I've done so far. In terms of generating the JavaScript that runs this generic code, that part's now easy for me. In fact, there's a hint. Generics don't require any special code generation. That's what makes them so special. Side point. Um, but in terms of actually validating the generic definitions someone had made, the generic classes, the way they use the generic classes, that is the type of process and type of coding that has become so addicting to me. Like, I am so hooked. It is so much fun. And, um, and in for, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, uh, so I, I know a lot of us are from like JavaScript backgrounds nowadays. So generic is basically a way of saying in a statically typed programming language, I want to have, say, a, a stack class. And if I don't know anything about what's in the stack, then in a statically typed language, I say, get something off the stack and use it. And the, the type checker goes, you can't. I don't know what it is. You, know, it's like you can only do these things with it. So with a generic, you'd be able to say something like, this is a stack of pancakes, and this is a stack of booleans. 
And you would know you can only put pancakes in the pancake stack and only take pancakes out of the pancake stack. And it's the simplest way to explain it. And this is an example of a generic class in work. So this is Wake, once again, this is from a uh, mocking library written in Wake called Mockito. Um, and we have this, we have this line somewhere in the middle where we say needs when none. That is a generic class. When is a generic class? It's what tracks in our mocking library what to return for various mock methods. A return type is, of course, a type. So num is going to be the return type of this of this program. So later on, we use it. We say when dot then return one dot then return two dot then return three. It ensures here that we only put nums into it because it is a when of num. And later on, we say asserts when dot get equals one then equals two then equals three. And this once again, the compiler is able to. to Say yes, you can assert that this is a number, you know, the number one, because we're going to get some number back. And in terms of how you actually define this stuff, it it looks like this. So it's it's a, it's a lot like Java. Um, it's it got a bit of its own tweaks. We have this type T, which represents what we're a when of. It's the thing we don't know, uh, and we can do all sorts of stuff with it. We can turn, we can make an array of T's. Uh, that later on, we have a var t question mark equals returns question mark num. This is a non-throwing array access. So if the item doesn't exist, it returns an optional. If the item doesn't exist, it's null. And we can't accidentally use the null if it's null. We have to check if it exists first. <coughs> um, and you can even see, when you're writing a programming language, you have to account for everything. And one of the weird cases is right above here when we say, then return t returns a when of t. This is how we're able to say, then return one, then return two. And the compiler is able to know that a when of num returns a when of num when you say, then return one. So this is, this is all, I know it's kind of like, you know, it's a lot of code so far and all that. Um, but I had a, I, I never really even written any generic code until I, I interfaced with it a little bit, but I'd never written any of it until after I'd created a compiler for it. And by the time I had actually started writing this stuff up, I consider myself a pretty decent generic programmer because I've had to think about it so much. I've, I've had to think about all the edge cases and all the corner cases. And there would be times when I would be, I'd be thinking about what I was going to do next. And I'd go like, wait a minute. How does that work with a generic? Like, you don't know what type it is. Like, how can this, you can't do this. And, and I'd like think, I'm like, no, no, there's a solution. I'd think about it for an hour or two. I can, I can solve it myself. An hour would go by and I, I couldn't solve it, so I'd, I'd break down and I'd open up a uh, open up a text editor and I'd make a Java program that you know reveals this edge case condition and see how Java handled it. And every single time, Java didn't. It was just, <laughs> there's just certain things with generic where we don't come across them all the time, but they're they're there. You know, every language feature adds complexity, and there's edge cases in every one. And um, Knowing these edge cases of generics is the type of stuff that like type theory geeks like love to know that they, they know it, right? And it turns out you don't have to take a type theory class. Uh, I'm sure that would, would do it, but you can just create a compiler. <laughs> <laughs> so now that now that job is now that now that Wake has, has generics, I, mean, I never imagined I would ever do, and has some other basic features that make it usable. I wanted to work on how it interfaced with JavaScript. Um, I mean, I think we can all agree there's, there's basically one rule when you want to talk to JavaScript. You need closures. If you don't have closures, non functions, uh, lambdas, whatever you want to call them, and then you can't integrate with event listener APIs. You can't integrate with the DOM APIs. You can't have async method callbacks. And you can't integrate with promises. So you need closures. And I was freaking out about this a little bit because to have closures in an expressive type safe language, you need type inference. I just couldn't avoid it any longer. So I started, I started looking at how, how type inference works. And you know, how does Haskell do that? I've, I've used Haskell, it uses type inference. Turns out it uses Hindley Miller type inference, which, like I said at the beginning of the talk, just basically just doesn't work with object oriented code at all. And I got to learn about all sorts of fun stuff in my research uh, about how about where Hindley Miller breaks down. And there's any Haskell developer will, will not tell, he'll pretend like, like it's perfect. But Haskell type inference does break down. And there's some, there's some cases where you can get like really weird exponential performance and weird stuff. So scratch that path up. Uh, I then found uh, more what I was looking for by looking at how Scala's type inference works. And that was something I was able to get my head around. I found interesting to learn. And uh, 
sure enough, I come up with a syntax for how closures and wait might look. Um, that was a lot of deliberation and get, get it parsing and all that. And eventually, I was able to write this, the first lambda expression in the wait on wait test suite. So here we, we create this, uh, this array, this, uh, this variable, which is a, a type text array. Its name is filtered. That can actually be reversed. It uses casing to decide, uh, which I know that's weird. It's one of, one of the weird choices I've made. But I think var filtered text reads better than var text filtered. And sometimes it's the opposite. So now that we have this variable, we set it to the result of this expression. We first create an array, hey, hello, and ma'am. And we filter it down with an anonymous function. This anonymous function has one argument, t, and we don't have to declare the type. <coughs> the type inference has been successfully so far. And we use this, uh, this equals rocket to say, I'm going to return the value. So whenever t, whenever, for each item, if it is not equal to hey, we're going to keep it. And another note here of, of type inference is that we didn't have to declare the return type of this function. T that is not equal to hey is a type boolean. It knows that you don't have to tell it. And then of course we get this result saved back in the variable. We run some assertions on it, and uh, and this stuff passes. This runs on every build, and it is this feature I never like really didn't want to think about it. I was always thinking about so many things with just regular object-oriented code, um, and it really is just kind of amazing to, to just see here. So I was. I was you know, really started to have this done, and uh, prepared myself to uh, to write, make a cut a new release of Wake that allowed users to do list.filter, list.any, dot sort, and uh, and send it out to the world. Almost. Does anyone here know why I did make <laughs> filter any and sort, but not map or fold yet? I was just going to ask, what is fold? Fold, I will actually cover that soon. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a functional concept. It's, it's a way of making a loop with an anonymous function. Um, I, I that, you know, so, um, right. so when we're using text.map, we have to know in a static and type language that text.map is going to return different things in different times. If you say, what we're doing here is we're, we're taking an array of texts, so you can say Joe, Fred, and Larry, and we're turning it into an array of their lengths. So Joe Fred Larry would be three, four, five. The, the result of this expression depends on what you pass into the function call. And this is a feature that I haven't yet made. The way that it's the way that it is uh, written out there and invoked is perfectly okay. But someone has to be able to write a function that has this crazy property. How does someone write that? So you had asked how fold works. I'm going to use fold as an example. It's, it's better at indicating how this algorithm works and, and why people use it. But it does have the cost of being an extra level and you know, something else we need to know. It's a functional programming concept, and I'm just going to give you a quick walk through it. So we're folding this array, and it has two arguments. One is an anonymous function, and one is zero. Zero is what we call the accumulator. It's just going to be some sort of starting value. And then for every item in the array, we're going to pass the accumulator into this, fun into this function, as well as the item, and we're going to get a new accumulator. So what, is, what does that look like? And this is how I like to visualize it. So we have our accumulator of zero, and then we have our three items, Bob, Fred, and Jan. First, we're going to, we're going to make this function. So the function was accumulator, oh, let's see. Um, uh, so the accumulator is zero, and we remember we said the function was a plus i get length, or a plus t get length. So Bob is t, zero is our accumulator. This, of course, is, you know, Bob has three characters in it, so we're going to get uh, zero plus three, which is, of course, three. So we've now absorbed Bob, and we move on to the next one. We do the same thing with Fred. Fred is, has four characters, seven plus four is three. Or is it 7 plus 4 is 7? Mm -hmm. 3 plus 4 is 7. <laughs> I can't math, guys. Um, and then, of course, we finish, we finish this off by getting 10. So nobody wants to see you know, how to, how language feature works for something they don't understand, how a compiler analyzes something they don't understand. Uh, so that is, that is how it works, and we can move on to the cool part. So this is how someone in Wake can declare these 
sort of crazy functions that have different return types based on you know, things that, that happen at call time. We use curly, we use, yeah, curly brace A, curly brace to indicate something unknown. It's a type. It's an unknown type. And we give it the name A for accumulator. You can see the last argument of this is a accumulator. So our accumulator has type A. We just don't know. The mapper function is going to have a return type of A as well. We don't know what the mapper function is going to return. But we do know that it accepts an A. Oh, crap, that's actually not something we know yet. And then it also accepts the text. And then, once again, below that is a code that we have used. So how do you write a compiler that like, tracks this stuff and prints out errors? And how does this work? The compiler is first going to type check each individual argument. Uh, we're going to skip closures, though, because if we try and type check closures too early, we don't have enough information to infer certain types about them. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to type check 0. Very difficult expression to think about how you would type check it. And then afterwards, uh, right now we will move on. So after we've type checked an argument, after we've type checked a parameter, we're going to check to see if it's the original type signature. We're going to see, was this, does this match to an unknown type? And it does here. We see that num is being passed into the accumulator argument of type A. So we now copy this signature in memory. Right? It's a data structure somewhere in your compiler. You copy it and you rewrite it. So it now we're now going to fill in all the A's as nums. And in this case, we can treat it as no longer even being a generic functional. That's not always true. You can have multiple type parameters. But in this case, we can treat it as no longer generic. At this point, we are now going to move on to the next argument. So how do we, OK, what about this, what about this, uh, what about this closure here? Uh, so we don't know what A and T are, which makes it tough for us to say what the inside of the function is going to return, is it, is it valid? But what we do know is that we do know this function is being passed in to another function which accepts a function which has a number of attacks as an argument. So the compiler simply does a check and it sees A corresponds to this argument, T corresponds to this argument. Do they have declared types? And they don't. So we just, we just fill them in. We know it's a num A and we know it's a num T. At this point, we're now armed with all the information we need to make sure that people wrote a valid, valid mapper function. Um, we know the type of A, it's a num. We know the type of T, it's a text. And then text and wake is a primitive as well as a class, which has a get size method, which returns a num. So, so far we're good, so far we're okay. And we know that a num plus a num is a num. So there, we have done two things. Not only have we validated that there are no errors inside the closure definition, we've also found the return type of this closure. <coughs> so we now know everything to get a type to represent that side, of that, or that parameter. And at this point, we are basically done. The compiler has now double checked all your work. And all it has to do next is uh, just make sure these things match up. In this case, they're an exact copy. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily always be an exact copy. You might have to report errors here. But in this case, they are. And so lastly, we just have another return type. What's the return type of text.full? It's a num. I know I just detailed an algorithm for a feature some of you might not have heard of until today. And I know. Um, I know it's sort of this compiler thing and all that. The point that I'm making here is that I know this algorithm so well because I have to implement it. I had to implement it, debug it, test it. Um, you know, this is yet more generic programming that I didn't even know until I really started down this path. If I hadn't tried to make this language, I wouldn't know these things. I, you know, yes, a lot of it is research, but most of it is practice. If, if you read about something, you learn it. If you do it, if you implement it yourself, you learn it. And for me, it's, it's generic programming weight that has changed me the most. But depending on what programming language infrastructure you're going to create, you will learn about different things. Uh, you will learn different things about the language of choice or, or the paradigm of choice. And anytime I, I write generic functions, uh, even when I work with a lot of other languages like Scala and Haskell and things like that, I'm able to apply this mental understanding of this algorithm to my code. And I know that I have become a much better developer in aspects like this. 
and then I just I just have that much more brain space available to work on the code how I want it to work instead of trying to understand how the compiler thinks it works. There's a, there's a long story of getting way through these features I, I never, some of them I never knew about. Um, so where was Wake at? What, what is this, how does this story currently end? So Wake has a couple other features I didn't demonstrate, like it has exceptions, uh, it has namespaces, uh, it does have a basic standard library that does kind of just enough to keep on going with it, files, file primitives. And the primitives do have methods on them. They're, uh, they're primitives and their objects. Um, and then we also have a handful of non-standard libraries. So you saw unit tests, those are run with, uh, with triple unit. Um, it's for W unit, W being for wake, and W U is three U, so it's triple unit. We also have a mocking library. Uh, we have something beginning arbitrary precision math. Um, and so far we've had four contributors. Uh, most people have kind of just popped in for a little bit and popped out. Uh, but I, it is noteworthy, I, I put this slide on here specifically because our biggest contributor so far has been someone who had no professional programming experience. Uh, it's someone who liked coding in Python and knew a little bit of Java um, and convinced him to, to come on board and he's been able to implement a couple operators, um, fix some bugs. And our next big goal is still JavaScript interoperability. We have closures. But Wake is one world and JavaScript is another world. There's a lot of a lot of dissimilarity there. And we're wrapping up some, some really big plans on how to how to really make that work and and uh, and see if we can apply that to other languages as well. So creating a language has been so much fun. Whether it's creating a language or integrating, making tools based on other languages, um, you will learn so much. Uh, you will have such a blast. You will feel like a wizard at times. Um, I absolutely say it's a great way to further yourself as a developer, further your understanding of a language, and, uh, and perhaps a